Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Energy News Beat Daily Stand Up. Today is the weekly recap. Today is Saturday, February 3rd. I hope you had an absolutely fantastic week. It has been a wild week in the news. Um, we even had some drop on Friday that were just go check out energynewsbeat.co. Uh, U.S. officials deliver warning that Chinese hackers are targeting the infrastructure. Warning about the real question is more at Majorca in on it. Uh, I've been writing about this since uh, 2000. Uh, 20 that the Chinese have had huge impact on our grid. Lots more information there. If you are an energy expert and you want to come on the podcast, please reach out to us on energynewsbeat.co, subscribe to our Substack, and we are having an absolute blast. We're averaging about 35,000 people on our website, news site every day. So Thanks so much and uh, look forward, buckle up and have a great weekend. Talk to you all soon. Bill set to soar as report finds almost all major studies on net zero grossly underestimate cost. Michael, this is a really, really interesting story. And it is by the Royal Society is a direct quote in here. This is out of the UK. The Royal so uh, Society, for example, assumes that the cost Almost everything will have and efficiency will soar. It's not that impossible, but imprudent. Let me read you some of the numbers. Yep. I'm just going to read these bullet points, Michael. The assumptions, 60% reduction in offshore wind capital costs, 70% reduction in offshore wind operating costs, 50% increase in offshore wind output, 30% in reduction in solar capex, 70% in solar opex, 90% reduction in electrolyzer capex, 45% in electrolyzer efficiency, 60% in rep uh, reciprocating engine capex. 55% in reciprocating engine efficiency. This is bull hockey. I mean, I the, the whole Royal Society was, they inhaled on this report. I've got the link in here for everybody to download the report. My, uh, what I really want to know is, did the, did the IEA come up with these assumptions? Because these assumptions are out of nowhere i mean you're talking about oh it's going to be the assumptions are basically cheaper to build cheaper to operate more electricity output i mean in what world does that happen yes technology gets bigger over time we do bring down the cost of things but we're not even you're talking about this and we talked about inflation i mean you think about the world we're in right now it actually is getting more expensive to drill and expensive to outlay all of this capital stuff and we've had billions lost in dollars. I mean, Siemens has lost several billion. And there are wind farms that are not being bid on right now. The uh, U.S. government went out and put the stuff on the East Coast and nobody bid on any of it. You can't make any money now on <laughs> offshore wind. Anyway, no. I well, really I mean, different. offshore wind is probably holding up the best under the circumstances. Solar is what's really getting crushed. Solar, I'm gonna, I am gonna disagree with you, my young Padawan, and that is, solar has a little bit more legs because it does not have the moving parts. Okay. Wind, uh, actually, eight years is a number, and I mean, eight years. You got to walk away from these things in eight years. Yeah, I'm that, talking about offshore wind. I'm with I, you I'm on onshore wind. wind. I'm talking offshore wind is now, I'm my numbers are now coming in lower than eight. Anybody that says they're going to last 30 years, <laughs> gas-addicted Europe trades one energy risk for another. The U.S. is not reliable. Michael, I would not do business with the U.S. I would not rely on the U.S. We are worthless. Um, 
Friday, the Biden administration got in a war with Governor Abbott. He went out, and uh, this started out the other day, he, uh, Thursday, I believe it was, he put a delay on a very large um, uh, um, LNG thing going on. Well, he hauled, well, this is key. What did he do on Friday? He halted LNG exports. And yep. it is. Well, new LNG exports until they can determine some new EPA regulations. Again, this is it's it's pretty crazy. Existing LNG facilities are good, but new permits for new facilities, specifically that what's crazy is we, we just saw a Chesapeake Southwestern merger. What was the big selling point of that merger? Massive new LNG export capacity. Right. Oh, why it would have been nice to know that four weeks ago before that merger took place. Woohoo! Um, I'll tell you what's ab absolutely um, disgusting. The world is relying on glo our global gas uh, on Energy Newsbeat. I now have the global energy monitor. You have to kind of take a look at this with a grain of salt. Natural gas has 4,018 projects going on. Let me get rid of the pipelines. There are now 1,251 LNG exports and terminals going on. Let's get rid of the terminals. And then I'm going to go ahead and tell you, operating and under construction, there are 206. Mm -hmm. Under construction, there are 43 LNG export terminals under construction. Let's go under imports. Under construction, there are 64 LNG imports under construction around the world. Mm -hmm. Unbelievable. They need this natural, this LNG. The only reason we are able to, it is the largest export that we're having. If you owe $34 trillion on your debt, you got to have some exports. This man is breaking the economy, ruining us as a partner. Here's a quote out of it. U.S. LNG continues to be the cornerstone of Europe's supply and diversification strategy, said Leslie uh, Palti Gunsman, head of research and marketing at Cinmax. The Biden decision sends a real message regarding solidarity and the reliability of its supply in medium to long term. This is partially crucial at a pro, uh, particularly crucial juncture where supplies from Russia and other shipshers can be mired in unpredictability. This goes along with one of our other, the next story here, Michael. Russia is the winner out of this. Yeah. Qatar up, Mr. is the Russian. You don't mind pulling up that second image from this article. U.S. LNG is increasingly replacing gas from Russia. Look at that share of gas supplies that are from the EU that are coming from the United States. It's absolutely spiked. We looked where that black bar down there absolutely spiked. And Russia has contracted almost threefold since quarter one, 2021. On a on this article, Michael, I'm going to embed the video of the, all the graphs and all the charts that I did in preparation for this article. Yep. People will be able to see everything I just said, and it's in the video in this article. So that'll be up here in the show notes. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, so Ms. Producer, can you bring this uh, picture up here? I, I really think the wind turbine explodes after bursting into flames on quiet Welch farm, showering broken parts. This looks like my brother and I on the farm when we were having potato guns fights and we would put M80s into uh, uh, tire pumps and just blow each other up. Uh, Larry, the cable guy, learned from us because we blew each other up all the time. So let's go into this, this poor little thing. Uh, Nick and his wife, 61, 51, were stunned when they saw burning parts of the turbine fall more than 100 feet to the ground. Um, they're not very friendly when they start blowing up. No, and, you know, I mean, this, unfortunately, is, you know, it, one of it's the... A, it's it, th There's downsides to everything, but having exploding ex exploding engines 
on a farm is not good. No. And I think the other issue is this is obviously catastrophic failure for the wind farm. So the question is, do you have to decommission the wind farm? Do you what actually then happens once these things, you know, once this thing explodes, really like what's next? You got to take the ones that are irreparable after so many years, which is anywhere between three and eight years. Uh, and it's in Texas, it's over $480,000 just to take one down. Doesn't include transportation, doesn't include mm -hmm. getting rid of stuff. That is just the cement problem. So here's the farmers here. And the biggest problem that David Blackman and Irina and uh, Tammy brought up on the podcast on Monday for the, the energy realities is the fact that uh, you have uh, so many wind farms do not have the reclamation at the end mm -hmm. in the price. So these monoliths to uh, the Green New Deal, nobody's going to pull them out. So yeah, no, right. and uh, right. it's, so let's it's go to the next one. European Energy Channel's wind project offshore cancels. So here we are. Let's have a moment of silence for this wind project uh, off of the coast. Okay, thank you. Um, they they can't afford. Uh, here where it is uh, we've tried to get the project to fly among other things in coexistence with nature but we have to uh, note that the authorities and politicians have not much interest in this so they're only when they get their kickback as a politician they don't care if it actually gets installed <laughs> no, they don't care listen to this one since our feasibility study permit has a height limit of 200 meters and today's offshore wind turbines have become 256 meters, uh, it goes without saying the project has no future. So I, I didn't see how much they've already spent in it, but it's a bunch. <laughs> yeah, it's, I mean, it's, it's unfortunate because if anything, offshore wind has held up the best economically relative to all of the others and if we can't even get a new project installed, what does that tell you about the long-term well, the, outlook of this stuff? The one that we talked about a little while ago was the one off the Great Lakes uh, that had 40, yep. uh, was it 52 bi uh, million, 52 million, 52 million for four wind turbines and 27 of that, uh, was already spent on permitting <laughs> and they never got any install. African leaders have the right to define their own energy policy. This is talking about NJ and in, in one of his uh, recent interviews, I had the pleasure of interviewing him and the staff is now working on it in production with Cyrus Brooks. This is really important as uh, he is the head of the African energy chamber and he was being interviewed um, here, and uh, there are just some wonderful discussions in here. Um, Africa, his point is Africa's capable of financing its own future. Uh, the World Bank is forcing Africa to try to put in renewable energy, and they won't fund coal plants. They won't fund natural gas. They won't fund pipelines. And um, this is where I think he's bringing out some strategic differences. He's talking about Africa should change its perspective and not de depend on foreign aid. He wants to go ahead and his big platform is reaching out, developing jobs, developing the technology. And he and I even talked about having the same ability to mine the the Congo to mine things in Africa but yet bring the technology in and ship out finished goods from Africa that would bring the jobs to Africa that would bring the elevate humanity out of poverty in Africa rather than shipping all their natural resources out and this article really goes further on this um, uh, he says, my position is clear. Rather than succumbing to external pressure, 
African states should exploit their own oil and gas reserves to stimulate growth, create opportunities, job income, and reduce energy poverty. I absolutely love what he is talking about, and he's a man of action. Uh, take a look at this article. It is a fabulous setup for the interview with uh, that I talked about that will be uh, releasing here shortly. Norway defends deep sea mining, says it may help break China and Russia's rare earth uh, stronghold. Uh, this one might be also a either Tammy Nemeth or Irina Slav email that had this one in it. And uh, Norway, uh, I love Norway uh, from the standpoint that they have a lot of natural gas. They several years ago they had slowed down and were turning off their natural gas fields. They have a lot of hydro that they sell to other countries. But let's go through the top bullet points in this. In a vote earlier this month that attracted cross-party support, Norway par Parliament voted 80 to 20 to approve the government proposal to a vast ocean area for commercial deep sea mining. I honestly do not know the ESG impact of deep sea mining. I'm going to be studying this. And the environmental campaign groups say that the approval of uh, extremely destructive process sends a terrible signal to the rest of the world. The problem that Norway is trying to solve is that they turn back on their natural gas fields. They are now a major supplier through the fee, uh, their gas pipelines to the UK and the EU. And then when you sit back and take a look, we have China. And we have um, uh, it's crushing uh, it's crushing blow to the uh, critical minerals, and so you couldn't even think about doing EVs or the um, uh, energy transition. However, I want to give a shout out to um, Pablo Hill on the Crude Truth Substack. He put out there. And his comment was, China on book, um, ah, this was on a different one. I would just want to give him out a shout out. This was on actually the China on the uh, book oil, Pablo Hill on the Crude Truth Substack. I'm not, I had an interview with Captain Current uh, Kelly. He is such an ocean uh, uh, defender of the ocean that I'm going to reach out to him and some of the uh, issues that were out there were that in the deep, deep coal, uh, like the North Sea, deep sea mining may not have as big of a environmental impact. I don't know. But on the other hand, we've got to figure out ways of not harming the children in the Congo and taking advantage of Africa, and then also getting away from the stranglehold on uh, China. None of this is easy. And if you have solutions, uh, give me a call.